It's nice to see you. I have the privilege of bringing the word to you today. It's not an easy task. It's always a very daunting task. Um, Apostle Wally and Pastor Ronke and the family, they're away and they send their greetings. And I would like to thank them, first of all, for this privilege to stand before you, to minister to you. So we're going to start. I'm going to ask a um, uh, multimedia department to kindly just, first of all, open a key text, Hebrews 11, verses 8 and 9. Um, I'm reading from NKJ before that one. Hebrews 11, verses 8 and 9. And it says, by faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. I pray that we will all receive a willingness to walk in the light of God's word in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. He said, and he went out not knowing where he was going. We walk by faith, not by sight. By faith, it dwelt in the land of promise. We can see there, it left by faith. It dwelt there by faith. So the walk of faith is not once. It's a continuous daily thing. Every, it's, it's, we live by faith perpetually. Mm -hmm. in the land, it dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. I pray your family will not be scattered in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob dwelt in the same tent. They were bound. They, 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 they were bound together. There was that love between them in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Every agenda of the enemy to scatter your family is thwarted today in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. None of our children, none of our young ones will depart from the, from, from the way of understanding and abide in the congregation of the dead in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. That prayer is from Proverbs 21, 16. He said, he who departs from the way of understanding shall abide in the congregation of the dead. That means it's very clear that, you know, there is no middle point. You either dwell in the congregation of the righteous in the way of understanding and the understanding of the Lord or you abide in the congregation of the dead. That will not be our portion in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Today is our youth leader, so just permit me to talk freely. I'm not going to try to infantilize our young ones. I'm going to be honest. It's leaders. And so I thank God because we are either leaders at home, in the office, or in school. Amen. And I know you are all sharp and you are all brilliant. So I'm going to talk to you as leaders. Okay. And now let's open to Isaiah 54 and we'll read verses 2 and 3. And NIV, please. I just want to bring out a few things from there. It says, enlarge the place of your tent. Stretch your tent curtains wide. Do not hold back. Lengthen your, cord, lengthen your cords. Strengthen your stakes, your stakes. That means you must have a mindset and a plan for expansion. <laughs> For you will spread out to the right and to the left. So shall it be in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. You shall not be wedged in. You will expand. Your business will expand. Your ministry will expand. You will expand in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. By the grace of God, everything that is aiming you will be broken in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Your story will not be part of those who said, I, I am caught between the devil and the deep blue sea. Because when Israel was between Pharaoh and the Red Sea, the Lord made a way. The Lord will make a way for you. You will progress in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Say so your descendants will those possess nations and settle in their desolate cities. So shall it be in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. None of us will be weaklings. It's called young leaders. Leaders are not weak. We will not be weak. None of us will be weaklings in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. We will be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, the title of my message this morning is The Takeover Generation. Amen. Amen. And let me just, let's just pray. Asian words, ever true, changing me and changing you. We have come, 
with open hearts. Oh, let the ancient words impart. Ancient words ever true. Changing me and changing you. We have come with open hearts. Oh, let the Asian world depart. Heavenly Father, thank you once again. Because you are good and your mercy endures forever. That's why we are gathered by your grace this morning. To listen to your word. To be taught of you. I thank you Lord for the grace, the privilege and the honor you have given me to minister before your people. For who am I to stand to minister for your people, before your people if not for your grace. And so in the words of that song, that's our request this morning. Because the entrance of your words gives, give, give, gives light and it brings understanding to the simple. We are asking that let your words have an impact. Imp imp be, let us be imparted with your words this morning. Let us be infused with your words this morning. Put your words in our mind and write them upon the tablet of our hearts. And let us be transformed in the precious mighty name of Jesus Christ. And Father, we pray for our brothers in Puja and sisters in Punjab. Pakistan, who are currently undergoing persecution. Because indeed you are a refuge and a fortress. We ask that you guard and guide them, Father, in the precious mighty name of Jesus. Arise for all their help. For oh God, our help in the ages past. Our hope for years to come. Our shout and the stormy blast. And our eternal home. We call upon you, Lord, to do that which only you can do. And rescue them. From the hands of the wicked and the ignorant in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you so much. Like I said, the title of my message this morning is The Takeover Generation. And I was blessed during the hot service when Deacon Daniel was leading us in prayer. Jeremiah chapter 1. Remember, you talked about Jeremiah. I said, the Lord said to him, he said, I have chosen you, I have appointed you to uproot and to tear down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. And I said, that's what in my, in my heart to share. And it was just a confirmation, the takeover generation. Because God wants to possess nations. God wants to, 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 to you know, inhabit cities. And it is very clear from that passage that we just read, that God wants to take over, that he wants to be in charge. You know, where God can't reign, he's not, he, does not, he does not stay there. That's why I say you shall have no other God before me. If you have another God, believe me, God is not there. Uh, like what is it, Derek Prince, if you seek from Satan, what, what, you seek, what you should seek from God, he makes Satan your God. So, he wants to be in charge. God wants to have a say in every area of human endeavor. Think of it. Every sphere of life. Every sphere of life. Whether commerce. Whether health. Whether education. Whether politics. God wants to have a say. And his say is the final say. <laughs> and he wants you and I to be instruments by which it achieves this purpose. Permit me just to share a few scriptures before I delve into this message to just to establish it beyond doubt that this is what God's plan is for us. In Genesis chapter 1 verse 26, after when he created man, he said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the face of the earth. I will jump to Genesis 22 because the subject of my, you know, I mentioned three people who dwelt in the same tent, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But let me go to Abraham, Genesis 22, but let me start from Genesis 12 because that's when God called Abraham. He said, the Lord said to Abraham, it was then Abraham, Abraham, he said, leave your country, 
your relatives and your father's house and go to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will cause those who curse you. In you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And in Genesis 22, it makes that to show you that the work, work of God in our lives is continuous. What you think you know, it begins to give illumination into you don't know it all yet. You understand? And so in Genesis 22, it began when, when, when his faith, Abraham, the faith of Abraham was con confirmed. In Genesis 22, 17, this is what the Lord said. He said, blessing, I will bless you. That will be your portion in the mighty name of Jesus. You will be blessed in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. He said, he said Abraham was blessed, you know, at the end of his life, in every area. We will be blessed in every sphere of life in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. He said, I'm multiplying. I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sun which is on the seashore. And your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. Did you see that? Possess the gate of their enemies. Say, so in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. You see the condition there? So when Sister Abisola said, uh, you will leave me standing. And I said, it depends. So you understand where I'm coming from. Amen. Just to show... It's the plan is being there all along. Genesis 26 4. This is what he said to Isaac. He said, And I will make your descendants multiply as the stars of the heaven. I will give to your descendants all these lands in the mighty name. Everything the Lord has appointed a portion for you, you will possess. You will take hold of in the mighty name of Jesus. You will not come short in the mighty name of Jesus Christ because the blood of Jesus Christ has been shed. He said, All I've seen have come short of the glory of God. By the reason of the shed blood which has been shed, you will not come short in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. The Lord has promised your selfishness, God, is your is the God of your abundance. You your abundance is your portion. You will not fall short in any area. In Jesus' mighty name. He said, And in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my chart, my commandments, my statute, and my laws. I pray for everyone here who's an adult that you will lay good platforms for your children in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Because Isaac was starting from a wonderful platform. Because Abraham obeyed the voice of God. You understand? He said, because of Abraham. But now, this is what you do. Stay in this land. This is your own test of obedience. Because what Abraham started, you must continue. I pray our children will not be rebellious to the Lord in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. No young leader, young leader here will be rebellious towards God in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Because you will find out there are consequences as I move later on in, in, the, in, in my message. I mentioned Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Let me go to Jacob to show very clearly what the Lord said. To show that this expansion, godly expansion, has always been in God's plan and God's agenda. Genesis 28 verse 13. And I'm reading 13 to 14. It said, And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham your father and the God of Isaac. It didn't talk about it. Jacob there. I just want to put you now. I'm the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac. You will now on the, you later understand as we go on. There are conditions that make God your God. The God of your father is not automatically your God until you enter into certain conditions, until certain conditions are met. <laughs> I'm the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which I lie will give to you. I said I will speak to us as leaders, so let's be. Plain, the land on which I, you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. Now, it does not mean God can take care of you on basis of what your father did. But it does not mean he has become your God. You understand? He will remember, I said, they said, Rehoboam, let me give an example. It is not in my notes. You understand? Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. You understand? Solomon, Rehoboam, the reason why he retained Judah. Remember, David followed the Lord. He was a man after God's heart. Solomon was a king. The son of David was a man with God's divided heart, with a divided heart. And God said, ah, uh, no, I should have removed Solomon and the descendants of uh, uh, David from this throne based on what Solomon has done. But I remember my covenant with David. And therefore, I will let him do. And what I plan to do, he said, I'm going to tear the kingdom. You are not going to retain the same glory. He said, but you will have one. 
you know, I won't do it during, during the time of Solomon. I will do, do, uh, carry, it out my, carry out my judgment. In the days of David's grandson, Rehoboam, you understand? Why? But they will retain one kingdom for the sake of David. So God can, you can have certain blessings as a result of the stature of your father in the Lord. But that does not make God your God. <laughs> hey. Verse 14. Also, your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west. You see the spreading again. And the east to the north and the south. And in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. That's why they're heirs, heirs of the same promise. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I can tell you very clearly that it finds expression. I've mentioned Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And it finds expression in the life of Jesus Christ. Spread. Go into the world and make disciples of all the nations. So let me go there. In Matthew 28, 18. I'm going to give five. So, so examples I want to make is established beyond doubt, beyond reasonable doubt. So then Jesus came and spoke to them saying, from verse 18 to 20, that is uh, Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20, uh, to 20. And Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority, all, not some, not a few, all without exception has been given to me in heaven and on earth. That's why it's the king of kings, the lord of lords. The, the one who, who was, who is, and is to come. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I'm still in my introduction and I want to make, make a few points like, in terms of the expansion of God before I go into the critical elements that are there. First of all, what we see there, the expansion is godly, transformational, and progressive. It's like go into the world and make disciples of, the, of all nations. And when it says start from Judah, Samaria, and to the ends of the world. So it's progressive. It is transformational. There must be a change. Make disciples of all nations. Teaching them to obey. Or, so it's transformational. That's why in Matthew 13, when Jesus Christ was giving analogies of the kingdom of God, he compared it to 11. He said it's like a woman who takes 11 and um, puts it in three measures of meal. And the whole thing leavens the whole, is it dough or whatever, the whole meal. I can't remember what, like the exact term. I said he also compares it to a mustard seed. He said which is like the smallest of seeds which a man plants. And then the thing grows Bigger than shops and the greatest of all trees. So it is trans, it is godly, transformational, and progressive. The second thing I want to mention when we see in that scripture in Isaiah 54, and it says very clearly that you know that um, sorry, let me just say it says, I just want to make sure that your descendants will dispossess nations and settle in their desolate cities. God is not just talking about physical, geographic locations. I need to explain that. He's also talking about people, human beings. Why do I know this? Remember Matthew 5, our scripture said, You are the light of the world, the salt of the earth, a city set upon the hill. So that met, it can be used as a metaphor for people. So I'm not saying the geographical locations are not included, but I'm saying it's more than that. It's about human beings first. We got anything. We, it is not just about geographic cities and nations that God is interested in, though they are included. But it's a metaphor. Sometimes it can be a metaphor for the people. So as I talk through to us, I want us to just remind you that I'm talking when I speak, you need to think in terms of dual, duality, not just geographic location, physical location, but about people, about rescuing people. The th other thing will be, I also want to, I'm going to ask uh, multimedia to just show, not show, not, not play, it's not a video, please don't play the video, a play video. Just, you know, the poster I sent, the snipped, yeah, just displayed. The enemy also wants to take over. That's why he said to Abraham, said, your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. So if you are possessing the gate of your enemies, it means it was already possessed by someone. So I want to give this as an example. So this happened just this June 24, 2023. And this was a drag parade in New York City where they say the chant was 
what they say, what they say. You understand? They said who they were. They said we are here. And we are coming for your children. But I wish they were coming. Unfortunately, they are already here. So, let me just... <laughs> that's the sister Betty's life. It's truth. It's just the truth of the matter. Look, if the teachers think this way, our children are already in captivity. But minus our children in Jesus' name. Because we will do the right thing. Because we train them up in the way of the Lord. So you don't need to show it's okay. They've seen it. I wish. So, they, although they said, oh, it was just fun. But the reality is, I mean, Pastor Sam will know that they are saying that in the place of camaraderie is where we know the truth. And the reality is, the philosophical bend in the ideology of teachers so far is such that they are shaping, that's the way they are shaping children. So, let, so they're already here. And unfortunately, it's not just uh, schools. Even in some churches. Unfortunately, I, th those ones can't be the church of Christ anymore. Because if you're prayed by a wisdom which, is, which James describes as earthly, sensual, and demonic, you are not of Christ. You are operating in the, in the doctrine of demons. If what God Christ's word is not final, if Jesus is no longer at the center of what you do, but what men think, or what feels good to men, then you have departed from the way of understanding. If our father, it feels good to turn our father to our mother because it appeals to the spirit of the age. You are operating by the spirit of the age, not by the spirit of Christ. Sometimes we need to lay this thing bare, even before our young leaders. There's no point just um, packaging it. Uh, one, of, one of the vital lessons I learned many years ago, I was at the train station. Um, I think in... Which train station was this? North Greenwich. Uh, was it North Greenwich? I can't remember. And I sat down. And a guy sat beside me. They said, saw me reading my Bible. And he began to ask me questions. He said, um, you know, began to talk all this philosophical, nice city. You know when human beings are nice? That's why nice is not one of the fruits of the spirit. <laughs> he said, be kind. <laughs> I can share with you. You know, one day I, was, I had a friend. Very nice. I said, wow, Lord, this lady is nice. And the Lord said to me, will the Lord hear when she calls out? If the basis by which you make your choices are that people are nice, you're not on the right, wrong road. So I'm not saying it's not, not good to be nice, but that's not the basis. And so I sat down, I, and the guy began to ask, he said, but we're all children of God. I, okay. I'm thinking, as long as you're a, we're all creation of God. I said, but not all. I just laid it bare before him. And he said, thank you very much. You are the first person that has said this to me. And I came to realize a lot of times we do people the disservice by packaging things that didn't, does not need to be packaged. Our children reminded us, remember, our children's service, when they ministered powerfully the gospel. Thank you to the children's church. You, you guys did the children's church teacher. Wonderful. Uh, did they try to package it? They laid it bare. But I have a good news. Though the enemy has taken over the lives of men with his deceptive philosophies and his powers, God wants men delivered. He wants people delivered from the powers and philosophies that hold people captive. Permit me to, like Paul will say, I don't want to, just to share three uh, um, examples from my personal life. Not personal in terms of praying my fam family, myself, my family, and I. No. To show that God wants to expand and release men from the, from, from the grip of the enemy. Let me give one, one simple one. I, I, I will start with that. I was, the day I was working in an organization, and my boss... All of a sudden, they started to panic. He said, wow. He couldn't find some contract documents. He checked all the repositories. He couldn't. He began to panic. 
so I just sat down there. And it came to my thought, ask him to check his email. I just sat there, I said, um, John, uh, have you checked your email? Just check an email in case somebody, while you were having these um, negotiations, it was sent to you by email or someone, you passed it on by email. And that's where he found it. You can see God rescued someone from sleepless night that night and possibly his career. You may say, oh, that could be intellectual. Let me bring it to the more what you call spiritual. Because sometimes we don't believe that God wants to op- us to operate the supernatural naturally. And so we now ascribe it to something as you say, you don't think it is God. Okay, so let me give you one that you consider, some that two more that you may consider spooky. Because this thing is not based on your intellectual capacity, nor social status. That's why Paul was saying to the Corinthian church, consider yourself, say, not many of you are wise according to worldly standard, according to the world, world standard. Not many of you are of noble birth, but God has chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. Foolish things. So, the Holy Spirit is an equalizer. It does not matter what your social status is. It does not matter what your intellect, intellectual capability is. The, uh, everyone, it's like, it, like, I love the Holy Spirit. God just equalized everyone. I have the Holy Spirit. You have the Holy Spirit. One and the same. God bless you all. You understand? Have a nice day. Second one. Um, there was a woman I stayed with when I, when I first came. I call, him, call her my aunt when I came to the UK and after I moved out I heard that her daughter had departed from home without any without any goodbye without any, nobody knew, knew where she was let me just lay bare she just disappeared and I heard I was troubled why may some made it a topic of conversation I went into prayer and it was a judicial prayer Lord this woman has been good to me this cannot happen. Therefore, Lord, she must be brought home. As I slept that night, the Lord just showed me and said, this is what will happen. He said, this girl will be uncomfortable where she is and she'll make her way back home. I pray in the mighty name of Jesus Christ that for every one Ammonite, this is the home of the restored people, by the reason of the fact that this is the place of the restored people, that every child that has departed, some are still here physically, but they've departed in, in spirit, that the Lord will bring them back home in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. They will not find comfort in the congregation of the dead in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. <laughs> okay third one I-, I was mentoring someone at work and I also managed the person and so giving him some tasks to do execute and it wasn't executing it well and I would, you know when you are doing detail of how you should and nothing was coming I was inputting there was no output <laughs> you understand ah uh-uh. So I just called him to one to one. My first inclination, natural man would be, let me just give this guy one to one. Be clear, you are not delivering. But I just decided to come now. I said, let me find out first. I said, you know what? This is it. I've given you this task. This is what I've not seen anything. What is wrong with you? What's really happening? Tell me. The guy began to open his life up to me. And he said, bottom line is, he felt the world was against him that as if uh, something was wrong. Okay, I'm, I'm not going to... Be, and it was the, of the millennial Gen Z generation. But as I sat there and I was listening, I, God enabled me to discern that there was something spiritual behind. And not particularly related to him, but related to the, his lineage. God, but I didn't say anything to him. I, God enabled me to discern. So I kept I said, you know what, this is what we'll do. While he was in tears, I said... Let me go to my, let me reschedule meetings that I need to reschedule. Block my calendar and we just go, go for a coffee and then we'll talk. And so we went and we sat down. I did what I just encouraged him. Encourage his faith. Now let me let me just lay it bare. It's parents, Christians. Create Christians. So just don't think he's an unbeliever. So I just uh, so I just counseled him, encouraged him in the faith. Because that's important to me. And the next morning, I didn't say anything to him about what I picked up because I even couldn't even give expression to it. I sensed it, 
but I couldn't give an expression to it. And it was of the Gen Z millennial generation. You know, <laughs> we still need to raise them up. God help us in Jesus' name. <laughs> Amen. So, in the morning, as I prayed, I was on my prayer path. I began to pray. Serious. During my prayer, I fell, to, fell into a trance. And all I saw, I saw, in the trance, I just saw a figurine. And something coming up to shatter that finger ring. I'm just showing you that God wants us to deliver and rescue men from captivity. And the expansion, that means you need to go beyond the sphere of the, the four walls. So I shared with you examples that are beyond just the four walls of harmony. You understand what I'm saying? To show that God wants men to be delivered. Amen. It is obvious from what I said that we do not take over using worldly means. That's why I gave those examples. That spiritually, you understand? The weapons of our warfare, the weapons which we, used to f f we, which we used to fight are not the weapons of the world, but they have divine power. Divine power. <laughs> uh, there, there. It takes God's blessing to take over on his behalf. You can't take over on behalf of God just using your natural means. It takes God's blessing to take over on his behalf. I'm still in my introduction. The blessing can be passed on from one generation to the other. You see what I said? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob dwelt in the same tent, heirs of the same promise. Can be passed on from one generation to the other. Can I just be on? It is not just certain conditions must be fulfilled. It is not just by physical, but automatically you will inherit it. Who became the leader of um, um, Israel after Moses? What was there? No correlation. And so, Romans will tell us, Paul was right, and he said, you know what? Not all Israel are Israel. Not all descendants of Abraham, natural descendants of Abraham, are of Abraham. I just need to bring that up. So, this thing can be passed on, but it is spiritual. We must remember that rather than just uh, natural. So, it is very clear that God wants us to be instruments of takeover. You can call it old style takeover if, if, that, if you want to call it that because it very bit has to be. <laughs> because the enemy will not give up easily, will not hand over what he has easily. You understand? We are not here to beg. We are not here to appease him. We are here to take over. Amen? Amen. Take over nations. Take over cities. Take over for God in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. But sometimes the challenge is we are unwilling. Let me be honest. We are unwilling. We are unwilling. And sometimes, it could be a combination of both. The other reason is that what we have been equipped with, we have not exercised it at all. So we are not even qualified. Because there are certain conditions. You don't just go out and say you are representing God. Okay, let me give an example. Jesus Christ said to them, said, go into the world and make disciples of all nations. But may I remind you that it was people he had um, trained, he called, can I just say, they, they abided, they dwelt with him. They said, where do you stay? Equipped, and then they had the power of the Holy Ghost that he sent out. Let me now share some elements that should be in place for takeover, for those who want to take over. The first thing I want to share is what I call confidence. Confidence in God. He said, by faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called. By faith, Abraham obeyed. The first point, element is confidence in God. Because in NIV, Hebrews 11, 1, now faith is this. I'm just talking about faith. Now faith is the confidence in what we hope for and assurance of what we do not see. Faith. That's the shortest. I'm not going to expand on that because we all know that. Second point I want to make is community of the godly. The primary focus of Abraham was not eating and drinking. They ate, they drank, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It was not talking about the latest fashion trend. It was not talking about the latest gossip in social media or the latest musical release. They were there for something more profound. They were not there for earthly, uh, what you call, temporal things and temporal pleasures. They were looking at something more eternal. 
You understand? You understand? That's something of eternal value. He said, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob dwelt in the same tent. So when I say dwelling, where are you abiding? Where is your fellowship? This community had a focus. The community of God, they had a focus. Just as like at HCC, we have a vision. You understand? The scripture says they were heirs of the same promise. So there was a focus. They knew one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one spirit. That community was collaborative and cooperative. The reason why I know is that, you know what? They all said they were heirs of the same promise. And two cannot work together unless they agree. So they dwelt in the same place. Dwelt in the same place. And you know what? It's not age, restricted by age. Abraham died at 175. At the time Abraham died, Isaac was 75. Jacob was 15. I deliberately measured those ages, 15. So from the, let's say, age 0 to 15, Jacob was there. So it's not about function of age. So this thing we are talking about, it was from, a, from everyone from the time Abraham received the vision. Everyone that was connected to him was part of it. That was part of that promise, was part of it. And was not restricted by age. They all own the promises. Are you owning the vision of HCC? Do you even know what the vision is? This community was, godly community, was personal and relational. The scripture did not say Abraham and others. It was specific. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Abraham, are you still hiding? Do we know who you are? Can you be counted upon? Relational and personal. God is a relational God. It's very personal. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob dwelt in the same tent. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It was not virtual. It wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't. You know, if you are still relating virtually, well, it is time for you to develop the connections with other believers. It is time to move and walk in the footsteps of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob if you want to take over. Just because God said it does not mean it will happen. Conditions must be fulfilled. The community of believers is also, of the godly, of believers, is a place of protection. We know the story in Genesis 38, how Judah left his brothers and then he went to Hiram you know, of, the, of, of Adullam. And, you know, from there, went to a Canaanites. We thank God that God restored him in his mercy. You understand? But he didn't need to go through that route. It exposed him. You see, sometimes we are too confident in our ability. And we've forgotten that God puts us, he sets the solitary into a family for a reason. One of the reasons is protection. Let me give my own story and my own example. Uh, I was working in for an organization when I had finished school. At that well, university, I wasn't, I wasn't Jim Jim, uh, like a lot of people. I wasn't even a Christian for most of it, or to my final year. Even at that, I wasn't serious. So I got, started working in an organization, and it was at that time I, I became spirit-filled. I was baptized. Imagine, I, in the community of believers, I was baptized. I was excited. Lord, oh, wow. And the next thing I heard... As I came baptized, my company just told me, oh, well, by the way, get ready. Just takes a few days of leave. When you come back, we're transferring you to another location. All your travel arrangements will be taken care of. Just get ready and just make sure you get on flight on, uh, was it Wednesday? Monday morning. Yeah, it was Monday. So I took a few days off. I think two, two or three days. So I reported. You know, I didn't want to go. I was giving that news on Friday. I was troubled. Lord, I'm just enjoying fellowship. Fellowship of the Holy Spirit. And then you are exposing me to, uh, to beasts. You understand? Because I knew what was going on. Let me be honest. If anyone that tells you that natural human being is good, is a liar. It's because the conditions are not yet right. Let me be Where I was going, they said we are transferring to our plant. It was a construction site. 
And because it was on a small island, yeah, and people from all over the world were working there. And generally, even if you were married, you came as single. That, that was just it. And the lifestyle was riotous. And, and believe, it, believe me, you understand? Once that restriction was gone, people lived in here. I knew what was happening. I didn't want to go. And the Lord gave me a wisdom. He said, why not call your friend who's there? Ask him if there's a fellowship there, if there's a church. That was not, I called him, and the guy told me, he said, ah, there's a man who runs a fellowship at JV camp. Blah, 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 you can come in here. I got there on Monday. Wednesday fellowship, I was there on Wednesday. And it was there, I learned the post. Everywhere I go, find yourself, make yourself accountable to the body of believers. It's a way of protection. So for those of you who are going to university, that's wisdom for you. You don't need to wait. Locate yourself in a fellowship of believers. It's a protection. Don't overestimate your capability. Satan is wiser than you. Don't go on a solo project. You will not survive. Can I be honest? I wasn't the only Christian there. There were many who came as believers. Unfortunately, when we were on that island, many did not survive. Because it was not an island, a small island, and locating churches was not convenient. It was not easy. There was money, there was women. So people lived, and it was a hard life. We were Monday to Sunday working. We did Monday to Saturday, 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. from my own uh, this thing. So people lived hard. And frankly, it was lonely being a believer. I'm just, it was during one of those times I just realized when I went back to uh, home that I just had to bring my love for Christian music. Ah, no, it escalated there. Because I would just sit down alone in my home. Everyone disappeared. Everyone out to go and have fun in a hotel. I would just be alone. In the whole, uh, I can't talk how many streets in the camp, I would just be listening to Christian music, reading my Bible. <laughs> Okay, let me mention another element, covenant. Covenant. They were all brought into the knowledge of the covenant of the Lord. And I'm going to say this and I'm going to spend a few minutes here because it's critical to whatever we may be doing. Well, uh, let me just say, what's a covenant? Well, a covenant is an agreement. This one I want to say that is personal. It's not just, a, it's not just an agreement. It's not just a contract. It's an agreement that is personal relational and relational that binds or joins two or more parties command committing them to fulfill certain conditions and enjoy certain privileges that's the definition me i put together because it is relational it is personal it, you know it binds two or more parties together it commits them to certain conditions they will enjoy certain privileges and there are certain conditions attached and i found that by uh, by experience that a lot of Christians don't even know their new covenant. If you ask them what's the new covenant, no clue. What's the expression of that new covenant? None. So, I'll just ask us, Hebrews 8.10, please. If you could just display Hebrews 8.10. Let's just read the new covenant. The new covenant was also spelled out in Jeremiah 31.33 and in another form in Ezekiel 36. I'm saying this because I know, and I'm speaking from my heart. I remember when I said I was on serious when I was last, uh, by final year, when I left university, I wasn't a serious Christian. At the early initial stage, I had a friend who used to go to church and said he was a born again Christian, even though he used to, used to smoke cigarettes. So, <laughs> but those are the sort of friends I had. So I came, and then he came one day. We had a friend, uh, a lady friend who was. A Muslim, and that guy just said, Oh, came to me. I didn't know what happened, transpired. They had that meeting. And then I got into the I got to where the room where it was, and he said, Oh, uh, for labs, I beg. So, okay, I won't say it the way he said it. We spoke it, uh, I was put it in English. He said, Please, he said, When this lady came, she said, uh, uh, The comforter is uh, Prophet Muhammad. I just laughed. I said, ah, it's the Holy Spirit now. Just casual, it's the Holy Spirit now. Eh. 
Okay. I'm just showing that sometimes ignorance has a cost. Okay, so let's look at the new covenant. Hebrews 8, 10, multimedia. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10. If you have your Bible, please open your Bibles. Yeah, okay. We should not even be in church without our Bibles. So I said, but for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. House of Israel. Okay? Remember, we are members of God's household. We are citizens of the commonwealth of Israel. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. You see that? This is how God becomes your God, covenant. <laughs> Said, I will be their God and they will be a, about, and I'll, they shall be my people. Let me say a few things about this, this covenant, what we see. One, it was initiated by God, not man's idea. Second thing, the conditions were clearly spelled out by God. God did not come here. Covenants, you know, human covenant, sometimes we negotiate. This one, there was no negotiation. God spelled out what he wanted very clearly. Because you are not, no man is fitting to input to that covenant. Because you will defile it. Because God is holy. It's the objective of standard for what is true, what is just, and what is righteous. The third thing is, it's personal and relational. That's why I said, I'll be their God, and they shall be my people. The new covenant was, it also made the provision for putting it into effect, because another word for covenant is testament, will. In the New Testament, will, testament. So Jesus Christ, by his death on the cross, put into effect the new covenant. That was why the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ was important. And that's why it says, their sins and their lawless deeds, I will remember no more. That's the basis. Jesus Christ became the atonement for our sins. New covenant. You enter into this covenant through faith in the finished work of Christ. That is all I'll say. So, man is not, a con co is not a contributor to the covenant. The Lord simply said, this is it, and enter into it. It is for your own good. Okay, I'm not going to go back, but you can see, I've spread out some covenants across God. So, that is the basis by which God becomes your God, and your people, and he, you become his people. It's personal, it's relational. The other thing, I element I want to mention is continuous education in the way of the Lord. Continuous education in the way of the Lord. It does not stop. Continuous development in the way of the Lord. Continuous development in the way of the Lord. That is why, you know, going back to what Jesus Christ said in Matthew, you know, he said all authority in heaven, uh, Matthew 28, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the, of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Continuous. What about Genesis 18, 19? One of my favorite scriptures in the Bible about Abraham. He said, for I have known him. Remember when God was going to destroy Sodom? He told Abraham. He said, he was considering whether to tell Abraham. He said, for I have known him. I have known Abraham. In order, the reason why I've known him is that he may command his children and his household after him. Which means it's not just his children. It's not do as, uh, do as I say, not do as I do. <laughs> say, and his household after him. That they keep the way of the Lord. To do righteousness and justice. That the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. You see the condition for the manifestation of the promises of God. What about what he told them in Deuteronomy 6.6 6, when Moses, what Moses said to them? He said, God was saying that, look, this education about the knowledge of God is not just once a week. Not just Sunday, Sunday. That's why at ACC we have various platforms. We have various platforms. Deuteronomy 6, let me read 6 to 8. It said, these commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road. When you lie down and when you get up everywhere, 
That means every area of your life. I told you God wants to take over. He wants to take charge. Every area of our life must be shaped by the word of God. Without exception. So tie them as symbols on your heart and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. One of the things I also want to mention about this continuous education, it is not just informational, it is transformational. It's about change. It's not the sort of theory that we just do, head knowledge. It's irrelevant to God. It's about transformation. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, Romans 12, 2, 2, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. I'll just take one more point before I round off this message. I've said the counselor. Maybe I should just mention craft. Craft means the development of skills and ability that allows you to be useful to society, that allows you to provide services that are beneficial to society in exchange for a reward. So it covers every area, including stay at home, mom who are raising children in the way of the Lord. But the bit I want to stop on, I call the counselor. Everyone who will take over for God must be introduced to the transformative power of the Holy Spirit. There's nothing as frustrating. I've been asked to do something and to live in a godly way without having the enablement to do it, even if you have the desire to do so. And so in Romans 7, Paul was writing and said, you know what? He said, oh, he said, he said I, I desire, my inward man, I desire to do good. But I see another law at work in the members of my body. So now Romans said, but thanks be to God. You understand? For through Christ Jesus, you know, to, through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. Critical. No natural human man can walk in the light of the Lord in the way we should without the power of the Holy Spirit. And so, Jacob realized this. Is it Genesis 32 when he was coming back from Laban, house of Laban? And he heard that Esau was coming to meet him. Remember, Jacob already had, by this time, God in his mercy had rescued him. He had given him things. He had restored him. So, he materially was rich. He was okay. And he heard that the Lord, uh, that Esau was coming to meet him. They said he stayed all night, he sent his family away, and he wrestled all night with a man, you know, and was with the Lord. And he said, he said, the man touched him in the hip, and his joint was dislocated. I said, let me go. He said, I will not let you go until you bless me. And he asked him, what is your name? Jacob, some planter. I said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, because in that nature, you cannot enter into what I have for you. Your name shall now be called Israel, a prince with power, a prince with God, because the, the, the God factor is what makes a difference. And I still go back. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob dwelt in the same tent. And the reason why I knew that he learned from them was Abraham used to be called Abraham. I'm sure in one of their conversations, Abraham said to him, I was used to be called Abraham, but the Lord made me the father of, me, of many nations. Uh, of nations. That's why I'm now called Abraham. It was the transformative power of the Holy Spirit. And therefore, at the critical moment in, in Jacob's life, he remembered and he cried out unto God who transforms and who changes. Surely be, the Lord will transform you. The Lord will change you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. You will not lack the power to fulfill the word of God in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. No longer shall you be said of you. You walk like an elephant and you eat like your an ant. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Your children will not depart from the congregation of the righteous. Because you have chosen to stay in the way of the righteous and the way of understanding. So shall it be. God bless you and we'll just take our offering tight and our offering there's no point trying to cajole you know the truth the patriarchs were excelled in the grace of giving we know that and so uh, follow their pattern that's what i will say but remember to give willingly not grudgingly not of necessity for god loves a cheerful giver for that which is given willingly is what is acceptable to him and so father we thank you for every giver in this place 
Thank you, Lord, for the grace of giving that you have given unto each and every one who, is, who has given and who is giving. Father, we ask in the mighty name of Jesus Christ that, Father, that you make all grace abound toward them and let them have sufficiency in all things for every good work in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. We ask that you increase and enlarge the store of their resources and multiply the harvest of their righteousness in the precious mighty name of Jesus Christ. God bless you.